Chapter 48 Ill-Motivated Dhritarashtra Thus being ordered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, Akura visited Hastinapur. Hastinapur is said to be the site of what is now New Delhi. The part of New Delhi, which is still known as Indrapasta, is accepted by people in general as the old capital of the Pandavas. The very name Hastinapur suggests that there were many Hastis, or elephants. Because the Pandavas kept many elephants in the capital, it was called Hastinapur. Keeping elephants is a very expensive job. To keep many elephants, therefore, the kingdom must be very rich, and Hastinapur was full of elephants, horses, chariots, and other opulences. When Akura reached Hastinapur, he saw that the capital was full of all kinds of opulences. The kings of Hastinapur were taken to be the ruling kings of the whole world. Their fame was widely spread throughout the entire kingdom, and their administration was conducted under the good counsel of learned Brahmins. After seeing the very opulent capital city, Akura met King Dhritarashtra. He also saw Grandfather Bhishma sitting with him. After meeting them, he went to see Vidura and then Vidura's sister, Kunti. One after another, he saw the son of Somadatta and the king of Balika, Dronacharya, Kripacharya, Karna, and Suyodhan. Suyodhan is another name of Duryodhan. He saw the five Pandava brothers and other friends and relatives living in the city. Akura was known as the son of Gandhi, so whomever he met was very pleased to receive him. He was offered a good seat at his receptions, and he inquired all about his relatives' welfare and other activities. Since he was deputed by Lord Krishna to visit Hastinapur, it is understood that he was very intelligent in studying a diplomatic situation. Dhritarashtra was unlawfully occupying the throne after the death of the king Pandu, despite the presence of Pandu's sons. Akura wanted to study the whole situation by remaining there. He could understand very well that ill-motivated Dhritarashtra was much inclined in favor of his own sons. In fact, Dhritarashtra had already usurped the kingdom and was now instigating and planning to dispose of the five Pandava brothers. Akura knew also that all the sons of Dhritarashtra, headed by Duryodhan, were very crooked politicians. Dhritarashtra did not act in accordance with the good instruction given by Bhishma and Vidura, but he was being conducted by the ill instruction of such persons as Karna, Shakuni, and others. Akura decided to stay in Hastinapur for a few months to study the whole political situation. Gradually, Akura learned from Kunti and Vidura that Dhritarashtra was very intolerant and envious of the five Pandava brothers because of their extraordinary learning in military science and their greatly developed bodily strength. They acted as true chivalrous heroes, exhibited all the good qualities of Chatriyas, and were very responsible princes, always thinking of the welfare of the citizens. Akura also learned that the envious Dhritarashtra, in consultation with his ill-advised son, had tried to kill the Pandavas by poisoning them. Akura happened to be one of the cousins of Kunti. Therefore, after meeting him, she began to inquire about her paternal relatives. Thinking of her birthplace, she began to cry. She asked Akura whether her father, mother, brothers, sisters, and other friends at home were still remembering her. She especially inquired about Krishna and Balaram, her glorious nephews. She asked, Does Krishna who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is very affectionate to his devotees, remember my sons? Does Balaram remember us? Inside herself, Kunti felt like a she-deer in the midst of tigers, and actually her position was like that. After the death of her husband, King Pandu, she was supposed to take care of the five Pandava children, but Dhritarashtra was always planning to kill them. She was certainly living as a poor innocent animal in the midst of several tigers. 
Being a devotee of Lord Krishna, she was always thinking of him and expected that one day Krishna would come and save them from their dangerous position. She inquired from Akura whether Krishna proposed to come to advise the fatherless Pandavas how to get free of the intriguing policy of Dhritarashtra and his sons. By talking with Akura about all these affairs, she felt herself helpless and began to exclaim, My dear Krishna, my dear Krishna, you are the supreme mystic, the super-soul of the universe. You are the real well-wisher of the whole universe. My dear Govinda, at this time you are far away from me, yet I pray to surrender unto your lotus feet. At the present moment I am very much grief-stricken with my five fatherless sons. I can fully understand that but for your lotus feet there is no shelter or protection. Your lotus feet can deliver all aggrieved souls because you are the supreme personality of Godhead. One can be safe from the clutches of repeated birth and death by your mercy only. My dear Krishna, you are the supreme pure one, the super soul, and the master of all yogis. What can I say? I can simply offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Accept me as your fully surrendered devotee. Although Krishna was not present before her, Kunti offered her prayers to him as if she were in his presence face to face. This is possible for anyone following in the footsteps of Kunti. Krishna does not have to be physically present everywhere. He is actually present everywhere by spiritual potency, and one simply has to surrender unto him sincerely. When Kunti was offering her prayers very feelingly to Krishna, she could not check herself and began to cry loudly before Akura. Vidura was also present, and both Akura and Vidura became very sympathetic to the mother of the Pandavas. They began to solace her by glorifying her sons, Yudhisthira, Arjuna, and Bhima. They pacified her, saying that her sons were extraordinarily powerful. She should not be perturbed about them, since they were born of great demigods, Yamaraj, Indra, and Vayu. Akura decided to return and report on the extreme circumstances in which he found Kunti and her five sons. He first wanted to give good advice to Dhritarashtra, who was so favorably inclined toward his own son and unfavorably inclined toward the Pandavas. When Kunti and Dhritarashtra were sitting among friends and relatives, Akura began to address him, calling him Varcha Travirya. Vichitravirya means the son of Vichitravirya. Vichitravirya was the name of the father of Dhritarashtra, but Dhritarashtra was not actually the begotten son of Vichitravirya. He was the begotten son of Vyasadeva. Formerly, it was the system that if a man were unable to beget a child, his brother could beget a child in the womb of his wife. That system is now forbidden in this age of Kali. Akura called Dhritarashtra Varchitravirya sarcastically because he was not actually begotten by his father. He was the son of Vyasadeva. When a child was begotten in the wife by the husband's brother, the child was claimed by the husband, but of course the child was not begotten by the husband. This sarcastic remark pointed out that Dhritarashtra was falsely claiming the throne on hereditary grounds. Actually, the son of Pandu was the rightful king, and in the presence of Pandu's sons, the Pandavas, Dhritarashtra should not have occupied the throne. Akura then said, My dear son of Vishadravirya, you have unlawfully usurped the throne of the Pandavas. Anyway, Somehow or other, you are now on the throne. Therefore, I beg to advise you to please rule the kingdom on moral and ethical principles. If you do so and try to teach your subjects in that way, then your name and fame will be perpetual. Akura hinted that although Dhritarashtra was ill-treating his nephews, the Pandavas, they happened to be his subjects. Even if you treat them not as the owners of the throne but as your subjects, you should impartially think of their welfare as though they were your own sons. 
But if you do not follow this principle and act in just the opposite way, then you will be unpopular among your subjects, and in the next life you will have to live in a hellish condition. I therefore hope you will treat your sons and the sons of Pandu equally. Akura hinted that if Dhritarashtra did not treat the Pandavas and his sons as equals, then surely there would be a fight between the two camps of cousins. Since the Pandavas' cause was just, they would come out victorious, and the sons of Dhritarashtra would be killed. This was a prophecy told by Akura to Dhritarashtra. Akura further advised Dhritarashtra, In this material world, no one can remain as an eternal companion to another. By chance only, we assemble together in the family, in the society, in the community, or in the nation. But at the end, because every one of us has to give up the body, we must be separated. One should not, therefore, be unnecessarily affectionate toward family members. Dhritarashtra's affection was also unlawful and did not show much intelligence. In plain words, Akura hinted to Dhritarashtra that his staunch family affection was due to his gross ignorance of fact. Although we appear to be combined together in family, society, or nation, each one of us has an individual destiny. Everyone takes birth according to individual past work. Therefore, everyone has to individually enjoy or suffer the result of his own karma. There is no possibility of improving one's destiny by cooperate living. Sometimes it happens that one's father accumulates wealth by illegal ways, and the son takes away the money, although it is hard-earned by the father. It is just like a small fish in the ocean who eats the material body of the large old fish. One ultimately cannot accumulate wealth illegally for the gratification of his family, society, community, or nation. That many great empires which developed in the past are no longer existing because their wealth was squandered away by later descendants is an illustration of this principle. One who does not know this subtle law of fruit of activities and thus gives up the principles of moral and ethical principles only carries with him the reactions of his sinful activities. His ill-gotten wealth and possessions are taken by someone else, and he goes to the darkest region of hellish life. One should not, therefore, accumulate more wealth than is allotted to him by destiny. Otherwise, he will be factually blind to his own interest. Instead of fulfilling his self-interest, he will act in just the opposite way for his own downfall. Akura continued, My dear Dhritarashtra, I beg to advise you not to be blind about the fact of this material existence. Material conditional life, either in distress or in happiness, is to be accepted as a dream. One should try to bring his mind and senses under control and live very peacefully for spiritual advancement in Krishna consciousness. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said that except for persons who are in Krishna consciousness, everyone is always in a disturbed condition of mind and is full of anxiety. Even those who are trying for liberation or merging into the Brahman effulgence, or the yogis who are trying to achieve perfection and mystic power, cannot have peace of mind. Pure devotees of Krishna have no demands to make of Krishna. They are simply satisfied with service to him. Actual peace and mental tranquility can be attained only in perfect Krishna consciousness. After hearing moral instructions from Akura, Dhritarashtra replied, My dear Akura, you are very charitable in giving me good instructions, but unfortunately I cannot accept it. A person who is destined to die does not utilize the effect of nectar, although it may be administered to him. I can understand that your instructions are very valuable. Unfortunately, they do not stay in my flickering mind, just as the glittering lightning in the sky does not stay fixed in a cloud. I can understand only that no one can stop the onward progress of the Supreme Will. I understand that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, 
has appeared in the family of the Yadus in order to decrease the overburdened load of this earth. Dhritarashtra gave hints to Akura that he had complete faith in Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. At the same time, he was very much partial to his family members. In the very near future, Krishna would vanquish all the members of his family, and in a helpless condition, Dhritarashtra would take shelter of Krishna's feet. In order to show his special favor to a devotee, Krishna usually takes away all the objects of his material affection. He thus forces the devotee to be materially helpless, with no alternative than to accept the lotus feet of Krishna. This actually happened to Dhritarashtra after the end of the battle of Kurukshetra. Dhritarashtra could realize two opposing factors acting before him. He could understand that Krishna was there to remove all the unnecessary burdens of the world. His sons were an unnecessary burden, and so he expected that they would be killed. At the same time, he could not rid himself of his unlawful affection for his sons. Understanding these two contradictory factors, he began to offer his respectful obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The contradictory ways of material existence are very difficult to understand. They can only be taken as the inconceivable execution of the plan of the Supreme, who by his inconceivable energy creates this material world and enters into it and sets into action the three modes of nature. When everything is created, he enters into each and every living entity and into the smallest atom. No one can understand the incalculable plans of the Supreme Lord. After hearing this statement, Akura could clearly understand that Dhritarashtra was not going to change his policy of discriminating against the Pandavas in favor of his sons. He at once took leave of his friends in Hastinapur and returned to his home in the kingdom of the Yadus. After returning home, he vividly informed Lord Krishna and Balaram of the actual situation in Hastinapur and the intentions of Dhritarashtra. Akura was sent to Hastinapur by Krishna to study. By the grace of the Lord, he was successful and informed Krishna about the actual situation. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the 48th chapter of Krishna, Ill-Motivated Dhritarashtra.